Thank you. Thank you for the committee for inviting me to uh, speak and um, honor to speak after Keith. So there I am. So I changed the title of my talk um, to the human immune system barrier to effective and safe genome editing to uh, broaden it out a little bit more rather than just uh, a very specific topic. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be involved uh, as uh, on scientific advisory boards for two companies, neither of which um, actually um, are excited about what I have to say. Um, so one of the excitements about um, genome editing is it has the theoretic potential to cure thousands of diseases affecting hundreds of millions of people around the world because it goes to the basis of these diseases, which is that, that there's a sequence in the genome that causes the disease, and genome editing gives us an ability to access that. And so I list uh, some of the diseases here. The other important point, and again, I think the society gets it, is um, uh, each patient uh, um, affects a large community of, of people. And so one can imagine that if one can develop curative therapies for single patients, you can make, um, you can put lots of doctors, nurses, healthcare providers out of business, which would be a great thing. Um, so the key for genome editing is depending on whether you want to access the mutagenic form of editing through non-homologous end joining or the sort of gene correction, homologous recombination pathway, you have to deliver either one or two components. You have to deliver a nuclease to first make the break, and if you want to do gene correction, you have to uh, deliver the donor DNA um, to template the repair of the break to insert the, the, the changes you want into the genome. So, um, and the key then is to, to get high efficiency of either type of editing, you have to deliver sufficient amounts of each of those components into the cells. So in the top left corner just shows that um, the more nuclease you can deliver into the cell, in this case we were using talons, uh, the higher frequency of the total amount of editing you get, although the ratio of HR editing to NHEJ editing remains the same. But to balance or to shift the ratio of HR editing to NHEJ editing, one, you can, one of the ways of, of shifting that balance is just to deliver more donor into the cell. So the more donor you can into the cell, the more HR you can get. And in fact, in this, in K562 cells, um, where we can transfect them very easily, we can actually get 1.3 HR events to every NHEJ event, showing that this pathway is accessible. But it does require that you get a sufficient amounts of this DNA donor into the cell. So with that in mind, um, I'll just point out that, of course, uh, the gene therapy world uh, has been um, stymied by the human immune system uh, throughout, through the last uh, 30 or 40 years. So it would be surprising if the human immune system uh, wasn't also a barrier to applying genome editing. And when we think about the immune system, there are uh, two part, at least there are multiple parts of it. And the first part I want to focus on is not the immune system that is in the title of the talk, which is the adaptive immune system consisting of B and T cells, but instead our intracellular innate immune system that detects pathogens, the pathogen sensing response. And that can be, uh, that's shown in this poster, um, which actually doesn't even include all the components of this intracellular pathogen response because it's missing rig I. But what it's showing is, is there's a plethora of pathways and receptors that detect different uh, parts of invading pathogens, including the nucleic acid parts of these pathogens, including CPG, uh, 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 double-stranded RNAs, double-stranded DNAs, um, uh, uncapped messenger RNAs. And what the end result, or one of the end results, is when cells detect these uh, pathogens is they activate the type 1 interferon response and robustly turn on interferon alpha and beta. And of course, the interferon response pathway is one of the best studied uh, pathways um, that we know. Maybe NF-kappa B even, be even better. So when we um, took the... Uh, DNA expression plasmids and DNA donors that work very well in K562 cells, and we were able, at the time, to able to achieve sort of in the range of 8 to 12 percent targeted integration of a cassette, and applied those same uh, reagents to CD34 cells, what we found is that the system started to fail miserably. Um, and, the, and I think a huge part of that is, is that we were transfecting naked DNA molecules into primary human cells that have the in intact sensing mechanisms that I showed on a prior slide. And what we saw is uh, interferon beta and interferon response genes weren't upregulated just two to fourfold, but were upregulated 
uh, 80 to 90 fold. So we were robustly turning on this pathway, making these cells uh, sick so they wouldn't divide, they would turn down translation, they do all the things that cells are supposed to do when they feel like they're being invaded by a, a virus. So <clears throat> through a, a number of years of work then, we've we and others have come upon the following system as a way of hopefully avoiding this intracellular innate immune response to the delivery of our genome editing reagents. So again, we do all of our work ex vivo, um, so you have to think about this um, if you're doing it in vivo. So we purify the cell type of interest that we want to modify. Um, uh, we put them into cycle, and then we electroporate um, an RMP complex consisting of Cas9 R, uh, Cas9 protein uh, complex to a guide RNA that's modified on the end to protect it from uh, exonuclease degradation. Um, and then we follow that up, so that uh, delivers the nuclease, um, then we need to deliver the template, and for that we use um, recombinant adeno-associated virus 6, a non-integrating virus that through history has figured out how to enter human cells in a, a, a non-pathogenic and non-inflammatory way. And what we have found is, is that this system, and others have uh, found this as well, so this system is extremely active in primary human cells. And this just shows several different examples of where we achieve on the order of 60 to 70 percent allele correction in sickle cell disease, uh, 40 percent targeted integration of a cDNA cassette for SCID-X1, 50 percent integration into the CCR5 locus to deliver an enzyme to correct MPS1, which will be discussed later in the meeting by uh, Natalia Gomez Espina, <clears throat> on the order of 50 to 80 percent targeted integration into human iPS cells, um, a 80 percent targeted integration in primary T cells, and a 50 percent targeted integration in mesenchymal stromal cells. So a really robust system to target integrations with high frequencies across a range of different genes and a range of different cell types. And one of the major reasons for that <clears throat> is comes out of work that was done, again, in collaboration with Agilent and I.L. Hendel, and then led by Kyle Cromer, who uh, analyzed microarray data from CD34 cells that were exposed to the different genome ed editing components delivered in different ways. So for example, when we delivered the Cas9 mRNA, you can see a volcano plot of the number of genes that were up and down regulated. Um, let's see, let's see if this will even work. Right there. Um, and there are 1,000 genes upregulated and about 10,000 genes downregulated. When we added AAV into the mix, there were some additional genes that were downregulated. But it's, what's interesting is, is that when we use the RMP or the RMP plus AAV, the volcano plots are much smaller. There's essentially very few genes that are up or down regulated. I'll note also on the scales here is, is that in the prior scale I was showing that type 1 interferon was being upregulated by a hundredfold. In these volcano plots, the, the small tick marks that you can't see represent two to fourfold. So while the volcano plots look quite large compared to what we are seeing with DNA transfection, they're relatively small. And then when you do uh, gene ontology analysis and look at the pathways that are being activated, what we find is that even with mRNA, and this is mRNA that has pseudo-U and five, uh, 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 five uh, two prime O-methyl Cs, um, so therefore has been engineered to avoid the immune response, we still see uh, gene ontology pathways, you know, V and IM for viral response and uh, immune response. And even with the RMP, we see some evidence of a DNA damage response, an apoptotic response, but we don't see the, the V and the inter, basically markers of the interferon response. It's interesting that we uh, don't see much of that with the A, when we, even when we add AEV, again, sh showing that this virus has figured out a way of delivering its uh, DNA cargo, its single-stranded DNA cargo into the nucleus of the cell without being detected. Okay. so. <clears throat> Finally, um, so we've been using RMP because of this ability, but we also had a very nice collaboration with Trilink, um, exploring different ways of delivering the Cas9 mRNA that might uh, avoid this response. And um, what, what Trilink did is engineer a Cas9 mRNA that was U depleted, because U is the, um, um, you know, sort of the, 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 the base that um, can, is often sensed um, in, in the cytoplasm. And by depleting the percentage of U's in the Cas9 mRNA, it actually depleted uh, or reduced the immunogenicity of the Cas9 mRNA. 
probably still not as good as RMP, but if you wanted to use an mRNA with reduced uh, signaling, I think this U-depleted form has uh, advantages even over the pseudo-U and 5-prime, um, um, you know, 5-methyl-C. Okay, so um, that deals with now the uh, intrinsic intracellular innate immune response. What about the adaptive immune response? And of course, uh, humans have, have a natural genome editing system that generates our immune cells. Um, and so our natural uh, genome editing system, we create a double-stranded break um, using the RAG1, RAG2 uh, proteins that uh, stimulates non-homologous end joining uh, between different um, uh, fragments in the immunoglobulin or T-cell receptor locus, creating our either our Ig our immunoglobulin or T-cell receptor, and then the immune system goes through further rounds of editing using an activity-dependent uh, uh, activity deaminase to either trigger somatic hypermutation or class switch recombination. So um, we have a, a human, immune, uh, human genome editing system to create our human immune system. And so the question is, is this uh, adaptive immune system going to be a barrier to the use of genome editing reagents, uh, either ex vivo or in vivo? And these are two pieces of evidence that repeat dosing, at least of Cas9, is going to be problematic. And the first evidence was shown by Amy Wagers and George Church in a paper published in Nature Methods in 2016, in which they showed that um, following delivery of Cas9 uh, to mice, that they found mice that had developed uh, T cell responses to different epitopes within the Cas9 protein here. And uh, interestingly, even in these inbred mice, different mice developed T cells to different epitopes, showing that in an outbred uh, human population, the idea that there are certain hotspots to engineer away is going to be very, very challenging. And then Char Charlie Gersbach and his group this year showed that in long term follow up of his. Uh, mice treated with a Cas9 through an AAV vector, they could detect high levels of antibody responses uh, when the vector was delivered into adult mice, although when they delivered the vector into neonatal mice, so when the mice still, uh, whose immune system were still being developed, they did not see this effect. And I'll come to this point a little later. So this is a barrier, so, so not surprisingly, Cas9 since it's a foreign protein, is essentially an immunogen, and that's going to be make it a real challenge to deliver this component um, beforehand. The question is, um, and now given that the in vivo use of either strep pyogenes or staph aureus uh, Cas9 has been broadly used, and I just show three sort of seminal papers uh, using this system to address Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. What occurred to us is, is that these uh, Cas9s were derived from bacteria that essentially all of us have been exposed to at some point in our life. Many of us are carrying these bacteria currently in our noses and on our skin, but many of us actually have had infections with these. So strep throat, for example, is studied by, is caused by strep pyogenes. So what is the, what's the possibility that in being exposed to these bacteria, our immune systems have already developed an immune response to Cas9. And I think it, would, it could have been very likely that we hadn't developed an immune response to Cas9. Um, there are more than enough things on that bacteria for us to recognize, including the cell wall. Um, and given that Cas9 is an intracellular protein, maybe we didn't. But obviously, I'm telling you this story because, in fact, um, humans have developed uh, an adaptive immune response to both of these proteins. And so um, this was led, uh, work led by uh, Karsten Charlesworth, who was a technician in the lab who is now a graduate student um, in the stem cell biology program at Stanford. And so the first thing we wanted to do was look for a human, humoral immune response. And we're not really a sophisticated immunology lab. And so um, the first uh, approach was to just use simple, sorry, Western blotting, sorry, went through it, which is how we actually, f uh, in the bad old days, <clears throat> was how people figured out whether uh, you were infected with HIV. You would have uh, HIV protein on a Western blot and you would screen the serum from people and see if they recognized the, the virus. So we just put Cas9, both flavors of Cas9, either Aureus or Pyogenes Cas9 on a membrane and then screen 34 different uh, serum for their ability to recognize uh, the proteins. And what you can see here is, is that um, we, we saw many, um, many people who had, again, healthy adults whose serum had antibodies that could detect uh, Cas9 on a Western blot. 
And what's interesting is they wasn't all the same. We had some people who seemed to recognize both proteins equivalently. There were some people who recognized aureus really robustly and pyogenes only uh, weakly. Some who only recognized aureus or only recognized pyogenes and a small number of um, uh, people who, who did not have detectable antibodies to either protein. Now, <clears throat> as we were uh, developing this assay, we were asked, well, we'd like to see it in more than 34. Can you do it in more people? So um, Eliza, uh, um, Carson developed an ELISA assay in which he coated plates with Cas9 protein, then um, uh, applied the serum to the well, and then detected whether um, there was uh, uh, antibody bound to the protein. And so this was a much more high throughput way of detecting whether there were antibodies to t uh, recognizing Cas9 in the serum. And so he did a series of dilutions uh, at 1 to 10 and 1 to 15 to 1 to 100 using now tetanus toxoid as a positive control. And we were in a part of the world that uh, I guess still believes in vaccination. Um, and so all of our positive controls uh, were positive. And our negative control was human albumin, and uh, our negative controls were negative. And what you can see is, is that very in different dilutions, the positivity both in the positive control and to Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes decreases over time as you dilute. Um, and this was uh, a screen of 17 different adults. So we chose 1 to 50 as our um, sort of one to go with. We felt like that was a reasonable dilution and gave us a reasonable signal to noise. And what we found then is that, you know, close to 100 percent of uh, humans were positive in terms of tetanus. You know, very few were positive to albumin, which is good. We should be tolerant. And between 60 and 80 percent of healthy humans were, t were positive on this ELISA assay at a 1 to 50 dilution um, to either strep pyogenes or Staph aureus Cas9. Um, I think this could be an underrepresentation because if we go back, what you can see is, is that 1 to 10, um, the proportion of positivity looks a little bit higher. And I'll just point out that when patients are screened for neutralizing antibodies against AAV, the usual dilution, now it's an in, usually an inhibitory test, is in the range of 1 to 5 to 1 to 10. So in fact, 1 to 10 may actually be a significant titer um, that remains to be seen. So, <clears throat> um, so B cells are one thing, that, that, but in, in many senses that's probably not the biggest problem because there's probably ways of delivering Cas9 that doesn't involve exposing the protein to antibodies that are in the serum. The question is, is, is the presence of a humoral response to Cas9 actually a marker of what might be a more serious problem of a pre-existing T cell response or cell-based response? And so, again, Karsten developed an L-spot assay in which um, uh, uh, you um, uh, basically put uh, interferon gamma antibodies onto a plate. You mix your cells uh, with your Cas9, your PBMCs with your Cas9. If you activate interferon gamma on the surface, that will bind to the antibody, um, and then you can detect antibody positive cells um, via an L via an L spot. Um, and that looks like this. So in our unstimulated cells, um, you see sort of a couple dots. Um, in tetanus toxoid, you can see that there's a large number of dots. And for, in this example, for Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes, you can see a large number of dots. Um, what we found, again, is, is that 100% um, of uh, uh, PBMCs from he healthy adult donors were positive for tetanus toxoid uh, in the Ellis spot, but only 80% sort of was statistically significant over the background for their sample. Um, and similarly, for strep pyogenes and Staph aureus, the statistically significant number of samples that were positive over their paired background ranged between 33 and 55 percent, showing, again, what I think is a relatively large fraction of hu uh, healthy adult humans have preexisting cellular immunity to both forms of Staph aureus and strep pyogenes Cas9. So what about a different way of looking for T cells? And so this is uh, looking at um, whether if you expose T cells um, to strep, uh, strep pyogenes and Staph aureus Cas9, do you see activation markers, so CD137 and CD154? And again, this is a little uh, our, our positive control. You can see tetanus toxoid 
the percentage of cells who activate CD137 and 154 increases. Um, and again, you can see that about 94% of um, patients are positive to uh, showing activation of T cells, that is upregulation of CD154 when exposed to tetanus toxoid, 94% for staph aureus, and 80 or 90%, 88 to 90% for strep pyogenes. Um, this is very similar to the results that were published um, by the group in Berlin, Wagner et al., who show very similar frequencies um, to strep, strep pyogenes, Cas9, in both the CD4 and CD8 population. And then finally, as a third uh, uh, sort of uh, assay for whether um, uh, there are T cells that will be activated against Cas9, um, Carson developed an intracellular cytokine staining assay. So remember, the gamma interferon assay is extracellular membrane-bound gamma interferon, and this will be looking for whether you see interferon gamma, IL-2, or TNF expressed intracellularly. Um, and so this just, rep this just represents uh, one of the positive controls. Um, so you see, again, in the unstimulated uh, cells, essentially no cells are interferon gamma, TNF, or IL-2 positive. In the tetanus toxoid, the numbers are low but statistically significant in terms of the uh, fraction of cells that stain positive for these cytokines. And you can see for both Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes um, that these are significantly above the unstimulated and mimic what we see for the tetanus toxoid, positive control. So again, if you uh, now screen uh, 18 different donors, you find that about 66% uh, of our positive, cytokine positive T cells to Staph aureus and about 44% are positive for strep pyogenes. And on the right-hand side is just the various levels for the three different cytokines. Um, so in sum, what that means is the, all of these assays are really internally consistent with each other with slightly more people uh, having uh, an adaptive immune response to Staph aureus Cas9 than Strep pyogenes Cas9. But using a ver variety of assays, between, one would predict that between a third to essentially all a healthy adult humans have pre-existing adaptive immunity to these two proteins. So what are the implications of this? Well, I think one is, is that um, it, the, it's prevalent and needs to be an important consideration for genome editing using these standard versions of Cas9. It's probably more important uh, for in vivo rather than ex vivo editing, but I think those of us who do ex vivo editing, in the back of our minds, we have to be concerned is if residual Cas9 protein is being expressed on the MH, uh, yeah, or peptides are being expressed on the surface, will that serve as a signal for removal of those cells? We think not, but it's something we're going to have to uh, be careful of. I do think that, you know, as I said, we're, we're not really an immunology lab, and so hopefully we can talk a company in the, out there is to develop some commercialized kits so that other people can use these um, and explore this uh, phenomenon more broadly. I do think there's a number of solutions, um, and one is, again, goes back to uh, the data from the Gersbach lab, which is that there may be a window of time where not only are you less likely to develop an immune response um, once you're exposed to Cas9, but you may not have been exposed to Cas9 at all to have developed this response. And so I think it'll be important if somebody develops a nice kit to screen then uh, children's and infants to figure out when in life we begin to develop this B and T cell response uh, to Cas9 to determine the window and for how long it lasts. I think there remains the possibility that one can give immunosuppression or immunodepletion before delivering a, a strep pyogenes or staph aureus Cas9 therapeutic. Um, I will say we have not tried to do that with AAV, um, although there has been some success in the eye by uh, immunosuppressing the eye. So I think there's an opportunity there. And then, of course, I think that, uh, it really accelerates um, or energizes the work to find highly active Cas9 systems from bacteria that don't uh, infect or are, aren't commensals uh, for us as a way of perhaps finding Cas9s for which preexisting immunity does not exist. So overall, I would say that the human immune system is going, to be an import, uh, is going to be an important barrier to efficient and safe genome editing, um, just as it has been for the gene therapy field in general. Um, for ex vivo genome editing, and I think for any ex vivo genetic engineering strategy, avoiding that intracellular innate immune system is going to be important to make sure that things are efficient 
and therapeutically potent. One can imagine, for example, that by activating the uh, innate immune response, one looks good in, in, uh, in, in vitro, but if one transplants those cells uh, or into a, into, as a part of a therapeutic, they won't proliferate and do what they want because they've been damaged. Um, and again, for in vivo editing, um, uh, we'll have to, I think that what I showed you around the adaptive immune response is going to be important to study. The other thing I think that needs to be studied is this potential synergistic problems of delivering an AAV vector or a nanoparticle along with these Cas9 proteins. We were just sell, uh, looking at these in isolation, but now you give two immunogenic components and the problems could get worse. And then finally, I just want to conclude, and one of the challenges in the field is, is that I don't think there's any indication that mouse models are going to be a predictor of what goes on in humans, uh, just like they have not been good predictors uh, in, other, in, in the history of the gene therapy field. So with that, um, I want to thank uh, Karsten and many people in my lab who've carried out this work, um, my collaborators, clinical collaborators, and collaborators in our GMP facility, collaborators uh, in industry and academia throughout the world, and uh, funding from a variety of sources to support this work. And again, thank you for your attention. I think we have time for a couple questions. Thank you.